Greetings. Welcome to Rev Group second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. This time, all participants will be in listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero from your telephone keypad. Please note this conference is being recorded. I'll now turn the conference over to Drew Connup for opening remarks. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Earlier today, we issued our second quarter fiscal 2023 results. A copy of the release is available on our website at investors.revgroup.com. Today's call is being webcast and a slide presentation, which includes a reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP financial measures, is available on our website. Please refer now to slide two of that presentation. Our remarks and answers will include forward-looking statements which are subject to risks that can cause actual results to differ from those expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. These risks include, among others, matters that we've described in our Form 8K filed with the SEC earlier today and other filings that we make with the SEC. We disclaim any obligation to update these forward-looking statements, which may not be updated until our next quarterly earnings conference call, if at all. All references on this call to a quarter or year are to our fiscal quarter or fiscal year, unless otherwise stated. Joining me on the call today is our President and CEO, Mark Skinetschny. Please turn now to slide three. I will turn the call over to Mark. Thank you, Drew, and good morning to everyone joining us on today's call. I am pleased to be speaking to you today as CEO and would like to publicly thank the Board for providing me the opportunity to lead this company. Most importantly, I would like to recognize the efforts of our various business unit leaders and the people that come to work every day making vehicles that make a difference in our daily lives. Over the past quarter, I continued my visits to our various manufacturing locations, meeting with local leadership and their staff, developing site-specific path forward to advance our strategic imperatives around product simplification and lean process capabilities. We have now successfully developed roadmaps with clear objectives in reaching throughput goals at several locations. These detailed roadmaps are focused on resource planning, both internal and external, factory and production line configurations, and upfront process capabilities across sales, engineering, purchasing, and material management. The objectives and processes are aligned with the RevDrive business system tenants designed to deliver continuous improvement. This morning, I will provide an overview of our consolidated second quarter performance, as well as detailed segment, segment financials. Before I comment on the quarter results, I would like to provide several highlights that occurred within our businesses during the quarter. Late last year, we announced that EMC, our municipal transit business, released its next generation hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric buses branded Access Evo. Since the launch, we have enjoyed robust bidding for both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell models. Prior to the quarter, we announced the first order of four battery electric buses from the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Within the quarter, we announced the first order for Evo hydrogen fuel cell buses with three units going to the Genesee Rochester Regional Transportation Authority. EMC's hydrogen fuel cell bus delivers an industry-leading range up to 400 miles and refuels in just 12 to 20 minutes. The Access Evo fuel cell, which is only water as a byproduct, will help the Transportation Authority work toward its goal of transitioning to a zero emissions fleet by 2035. They receive funding for the buses through the Federal Transit Administration Low and No Emission Program. EMC was recently named as an FTA grant partner by a total of 12 transit agencies located throughout the U.S streamlining the process to receive additional orders to be qualified for federal funding. Continued availability of FTA funding combined with communities' desires to improve their environments have resulted in a robust pipeline of new opportunities. Subsequent to the quarter, we announced an order for 19 fuel cell buses from the California public transit provider Foothill Transit, who serves Southern California, San Gabriel, and Pomona Valleys, including Pasadena and downtown Los Angeles. Foothill currently operates a fleet of 359 buses with a commitment to operate a 100% zero emission bus fleet. As a relatively small market share participant in a large public transportation market, 
We believe opportunities like this in the transition from internal combustion engines to, two tech, to new technologies will allow EMC the opportunity to be a disruptor and gain market share. The mentioned contract wins will not only contribute to unit growth for EMC, but also top line revenue growth as the average selling price of zero emission units can be up to two times that of an internal combustion engine. As we have previously discussed, our battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell platform has over 90% commonality and therefore we also expect to gain additional manufacturing efficiencies from this plant as production ramps. Our Type A school bus business, Collins, is also participating in increased demand for battery electric transportation solutions. Within the quarter, its bidding pipeline for EV buses grew into the hundreds of units and has active orders for 60 EV buses. In addition to providing a solution that converts traditional gas engines to electric, we re recently announced the first Type A bus on electric powertrain provided directly by a major OEM. In collaboration with Ford, Collins began taking orders for the new E-Transit T350 low floor single rear wheel cutaway in May. Within a specialty group, we had two EV debuts from our capacity terminal truck business. The first was the launch of its new zero emissions hydrogen fuel cell electric terminal truck at the Technology and Maintenance Council in February. Its long duration operating time, heavy load capacity, and quick refueling cycle have been well received. In May, Capacity also debuted its new zero emission lithium ion powered terminal truck at the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo. The EV terminal truck is powered by a Heister Yale electric powertrain and available with an option of 130 kilowatt or a 260 kilowatt lithium ion battery. The truck is expected to operate for the length of a normal shift before recharging is needed while delivering consistent power and maximizing uptime. The battery can be recharged in as short as one hour. Across the REV EV portfolio, bidding is active for both electric and fuel cell products as end users remain uncertain about the infrastructure, load requirements, and use case for each technology. With these launches, we now offer both fuel cell and battery electric solutions for terminal trucks and transit buses, providing our customers maximum flexibility. I am pleased that today we will be discussing results that include momentum of increased starts and completions across the f and &E segment, including both the ambulance and fire groups. As you know, we face key component shortages across many of our businesses throughout fiscal 2022. Due to the complexity, customization, and large number of SKUs required in fire apparatus, the fire group was particularly impacted by shortages. Over the past year and a half, the sourcing teams have worked to qualify an increasing number of alternative sources, which limited the number of key component shortages within the quarter to isolated events. Material handling across our fire plants is improving with greater alignment between production planning, procurement, and the presentation of materials assigned to specific vehicles. To further mitigate potential shortages and keep the line moving, the fire businesses have enhanced dedicated response teams with pickers assigned to retrieve parts missing from production cells. Communication across functions is improving with management activities focused on daily accountability. To help ensure that this accountability continues, I made a change of leadership and organizational structure in the fire group. Within the quarter, Mike Vernick assumed the role of president, rep fire group, overseeing all, bland, all brands. Mike has been the vice president of global sales and marketing at Rev since 2018. Under his tenure, our backlog for fire apparatus has tripled, growing by over $1 billion. Mike has deep relationships with our dealers and direct customers across all Rev fire brands, understands functionality and distinction of our product offerings and their capabilities, and has a unique perspective on the importance of our parts and service business, having owned a service center in the past. He has been integral in our voice of customer feedback and led various programs to eliminate product, product complexity while enhancing and standardizing our portfolio. Prior to joining Rev, he served as Vice President of Sales at Spartan Emergency Response, and he has prior management and ownership experience in other fire and specialty vehicle businesses. I was with Mike at the recent FDIC International Show, a leading firefighter conference, and the response to Mike's promotion was overwhelmingly positive. 
In addition to this change, I've added Andy Thompson to the team as Rep Fire Group Chief Operating Officer. This is a new position dedicated to managing manufacturing operations across all fire brands. Andy joined Rev in 2021 as VP of Operations across the enterprise, bringing his extensive experience in manufacturing operations, supply chain, and Lean Six Sigma. Most recently, he was appointed as interim VP GM of the Holden Fire Facility, where he helped increase plant efficiencies and throughput by implementing many of the actions that I mentioned earlier resulting in a two-year high in quarterly shipments at the Holman facility. Under his leadership, the plant has leveraged all production slots and reduced or eliminated gaps, realigned the assembly lines to reduce bottleneck constraints, launched several projects aimed at reducing production hours per value stream, and set the intermediate agenda for improved possibility. I, I look forward to working with Mike and Andy to drive continued improvement in overall fire performance. Within the ambulance group, quarterly shipments reached a two-year high and net sales reached a three-year high as the division benefited from an improved supply chain and key plants maintained higher direct labor headcount levels. On the last earnings call, we noted that with increased chassis supply, our ability to achieve or exceed the year production plan relied on the ability to effectively hire, train, and retain new workers. Within the quarter, we were successful in increasing the group's headcount and lowering year-over-year -year turnover each, at each of the ambulance plants. I am confident that the group will experience improved productivity as new workers are onboarded and begin cross-training. Finally, we experienced the anticipated normalization of recreation segment backlog within the quarter. The industry backdrop remains challenged with retail sales in the fiscal quarter reported to be down in the low 20% range year-over-year. Many dealers have worked to reduce 2022 model year inventory and are expected to maintain a disciplined approach toward overall inventory levels given the current interest rate and economic environments. We have been proactively working with our dealers through, with respect to age backlog. This results in a reduction of, in orders primarily for towable and camper units that are Lance East and West facilities and to a lesser degree cancellations within the Class A business which maintains a six-month backlog. We continue to expect a portion of these orders will replace with 2024 model year orders. Within the Class B and Class C categories, backlog remains in the nine-month range. These results are in line with the full year outlook provided in December and the first quarter update provided in March. Now turning to our second quarter results on slide four. Consolidated net sales of $681 million increased $105 million or 18% versus the second quarter last year. The increase was driven by higher shipments and sales across all segments. Fire and emergency segment sales reflect higher sales in both the fire and ambulance groups. Increased fire group sales were primarily a result of an improved supply chain resulting from dual sourcing initiatives as well as an improved overall component supply environment in addition to productivity initiatives aimed at increasing throughput. Increased ambulance group sales were related to improved chassis supply labor market and retention improvements mentioned earlier, and price realization. Record commercial segment sales benefited from an improved supply chain which enabled completion of units previously trapped in work in progress and price realization. Recreation net sales increased first the prior year as productivity initiatives took hold at our West Coast Tobal plant while segment pricing remained positive and added discounts. Consolidated adjusted EBITDA of $41.9 million increased $18.1 million or 76% versus the prior year with increased contribution from all segments. Higher contribution from the F&E segment includes improved results in both the fire and ambulance groups. Commercial segment EBITDA was related to improved profitability in the school bus and specialty businesses, partially offset by a decline in the municipal transit business. Recreation momentum continued within the quarter with increased volumes and price realization above discounting. The net result of greater profitability across all segments was a seven-quarter seven high in adjusted EBITDA dollars and EBITDA margin. Please turn to page five of the slide deck as I move to a review of our second quarter segment results. Fire and emergency second quarter segment sales were $283 million an increase of 16% compared to the prior year. The increase in net sales was primarily due to increased shipments of fire apparatus and ambulance units, 
a favorable mix of higher content ambulance units and price realization, partially offset by an unfavorable mix of lower content fire apparatus. Within the fire group, throughput improved sequentially and year over year to reach a six quarter high in shipments and revenue. This includes improved performance at our two largest plants, as well as increased shipments from our Holman facility that were up 70% year over year and 39% sequentially. With supply chain headwinds subsiding, all plants have had greater success filling production slots with a more robust clear to build process. A milestone for recovery within the fire group will be reaching the revenue run rate achieved in the second and third quarter of fiscal 21 prior to supply chain and labor market challenges. Within the quarter alone, we recovered half of the deficit between that period and the low point of revenue experienced in the first quarter of this fiscal year. We are focused on maintaining a cadence of new starts that are required to close the gap and position the group for additional improvement. We, incur we are encouraged that within the quarter, fire group starts exceeded completions by 6% demonstrating its momentum. As I mentioned earlier, ambulance group unit shipments reached a two-year high, up 6% year-on-year with revenue reaching a three-year high. Higher revenue is primarily related to increased shipments, higher content vehicles, and price realization. As we have noted on past calls, the re recent inflationary environment has required disciplined forward pricing strategy across all businesses. Due to lower complexity and higher production volumes, the ambulance group started producing units that are in the early rounds of new price tiers enacted over the past 18 months. We are encouraged by the throughput improvement we experienced at all locations within the group and the momentum it will carry into the second half of the year. F&E segment adjusted EBITDA was $9.6 million in the second quarter of 2023 compared to an adjusted EBITDA loss of $2.2 million in the second quarter of 2022. The increase was primarily a result of higher volume, manufacturing efficiencies, and improved price realization, partially offset by inflationary pressures. Fire group profitability improved 550 basis points versus the prior year and 520 basis points sequentially. This was primarily due to higher sales volume and manufacturing efficiencies related to an improved supply chain environment and initiatives enacted to improve productivity. Ambulance group profitability improved 450 basis points year over year and 300 basis points sequentially. This was primarily a result of higher sales volumes, favorable mix, price realization, and manufacturing efficiencies. Record F&E backlog was $2.9 billion, an increase of 60% year over year. The increase in backlog was a result of continued strength of unit orders in both the fire and ambulance groups and pricing actions over the past 12 months. The fire group experienced greater conversion of quotes to firm orders within the quarter while ambulance demand remained strong resulting in individual records for backlog in both the fire and ambulance groups. For the remainder of the year, we expect the F&E segment to post sequential revenue and margin improvement with approximately 75% of segment earnings generated in the second half. Turning to slide six, commercial segment sales of $142 million was an increase of 56% compared to the prior year. The increase was due to higher sales across all product categories and price realization. Improved material availability allowed completion of school buses, terminal trucks, and street sweepers that had been trapped in inventory. Dual sourcing and improved chassis supply have allowed unit shipments of school buses to reach a seven quarter high. Like ambulance, school buses have less complexity and a faster production cadence that allowed us to experience new pricing tiers more quickly than many other businesses. We have also started to ship more EV units which carry a higher average selling price. The combined result is a three and a half year high in school bus sales. Unit shipments of terminal trucks and street sweepers increased 28% and 50% and respectively as the specialty group implemented productivity actions designed to increase throughput. Within the municipal transit business, we continue to experience shortages of wiring harnesses and other components creating line rate inefficiencies and a significant amount of out of station work and rework which limited unit shipments within the second quarter and is expected to continue through the third quarter. Commercial segment adjusted EBITDA of 10.7 million 
increased 143% versus the prior year. The increase in EBITDA was primarily the result of higher shipments and improved profitability within the school bus, terminal truck, and street sweeper businesses, partially offset by manufacturing inefficiencies within the transit bus business. Record profitability for school buses is primarily a result of higher shipments and efficiencies gained from greater material availability, including chassis and price realization, partially offset by inflationary pressures. Profitability of terminal trucks and street sweepers benefited from higher shipments related to actions implemented over the past year to improve throughput, receipt of key components that allow completion of WIP units, and price realization. Municipal transit bus completions continue to be limited by shortages of critical components that result in fewer than expected completions and trap labor that weighed on profitability. Commercial segment backlog was $501 million at the end of the second quarter, a decrease of 6% versus the prior year. The decrease in backlog is primarily a result of increased throughput and a normalization of orders for terminal trucks and street sweepers, partially offset by record backlog for school buses, which includes strong second quarter orders, as well as price actions enacted over the past 12 months. In the third quarter, we expect commercial segment sales and margins to be constrained by supply chain challenges that are limiting completion of municipal transit buses. The benefit we experience in this quarter by completing partially completed WIP units in the school bus and specialty business will also diminish in the second half of the year. We expect lower segment sales and margin in the third quarter with improved shipments and an improved mix of municipal transit buses that benefit the segment's revenue and margin profile in the fourth quarter. This will likely result in second half adjusted EBITDA being approximately the same as the first half of the fiscal year. As I mentioned earlier, we are encouraged by increased bidding for zero emission school buses and transit buses and feel this provides opportunity in fiscal 2024 and beyond. Turning to slide seven, recreation segment sales of 257 million were up 6% versus last year's quarter. Increased sales versus the prior year were permanent result of increased shipments to Class A, Class C, Fobo, and Camper units, and pricing actions net of discounts in certain categories. Partially offsetting the increase were lower sales of Class B units related to supply chain and irregular, irregular dealer inventory related to the fourth quarter OEM recall that resulted in a large number of industry shipments earlier in the year. Shipments of travel trailers and campers improved sequentially, and unit starts increased 35% throughout the quarter as a new local management team implemented productivity initiatives designed to increase throughput. As a result, unit shipments and net sales of non-motorized units increased 29% and 51% respectively versus the prior year. Recreation segment adjusted EBITDA of $29.1 million was an increase of 1% versus the prior year. The increase in EBITDA was primarily the result of price realization, net of discounting certain businesses, and volume leverage, partially offset by material inflation and an unfavorable mix of gas units, and greater contribution from the non-motorized categories. While total units and campers are currently diluted to the segment margin, the business increased adjusted EBITDA margin 690 basis points versus the prior year. Segment backlog of 495 million decreased 62% versus the prior year and 50% sequentially. This was anticipated in line with guidance provided during the last earnings call for segment backlog to normalize in the four to six month range. The decrease is primarily due to continued production against backlog and cancellation of age orders, primarily non-motorized and Class A categories. We expect a portion of these cancellations to be replaced with upcoming model year orders. Class B and Class C based backlog remains in the 9 to 12 months range. The outlook for full year recreation segment revenue remains in the range of flat to down low single digits. Margins have likely peaked in the second quarter with an expectation for lower production volume in certain categories and additional discounting in the second half. We are focused on flexing costs when necessary to protect profitability and will continue our work to claw back a portion of recent inflationary pressures. The full year segment adjusted EBITDA margin expectation remains in the high single digit to 10% range. 
The combined result of strong first half shipments, lower production rates, and potential discounting second half is expected to result in approximately 45% of full year adjusted EBITDA being generated in the second half. Turning to slide eight, year to date cash from operating activities totaled 8.2 million. Trade working capital on April 30th, 2023 was 363.3 million, an increase of 15.5 million compared to 347.8 at the end of fiscal 2022. The increase was primarily a result of increased accounts receivable and inventories, partially offset by an increase in accounts payable and customer advances. Inventory increased 92 million versus the prior year period when it was more difficult to procure chassis, parts, and raw materials. Over, over the intermediate term, we believe there's an opportunity for meaningful inventory reduction as we gain confidence in the stability of the supply chain and chassis supply. We spent $6.8 million on capital expenditures within the second quarter, resulting in free cash flow of $8.3 million. Net debt as of April 30th was $221 million, including $9 million of cash on hand. We declared a quarterly cash dividend of $0.05 cents per share, payable July 14th to shareholder record on June 30th. The board approved a new share repurchase authorization of up to $175 million with flexibility to buy common stock in the open market at prevailing market prices or through block trades over the next two years. The new program replaces the prior $150 million authorization approved in September 2021, of which we purchased approximately $74 million in rough common shares. At the end of the quarter, the company maintained ample liquidity with approximately $306 million available under the ABL revolving credit facility, and our net debt to EBITDA leverage ratio is 1.8 times below our stated target range of two to two and a half times. Turning to slide nine, today we are raising our full year outlook for net sales, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted net income, and free cash flow. The outlook for revenue is now in the range of 2.45 to 2.55 billion, an increase of 100 million at the midpoint. The range of adjusted EBITDA has been raised to 120 to 135 million, an increase of 7.5 million at the midpoint. Guidance for adjusted net income is now in the range of 48 to 62 million, and we continue to expect cash conversion to be 90% or greater, with free cash flow in the range of 43 to 56 million. Thank you again for joining us on today's call. And uh, operator, we'd now like to open that call up for questions. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Thank you, and our first question is from the line of Jerry Revich with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your questions. Right, yes, hi. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone, uh, and Mark, uh, c congratulations again. Um, I, I wanted to see if we could just start the conversation and fire an emergency where it's nice to see the strong progress uh, on the starts. Uh, can you just talk about uh, where we are on uh, seeing higher price backlog starting to flow through? What, what's that cadence look like uh, over the next couple of quarters c compared to w w the strong performance uh, we saw in the second quarter? Yeah, as we exited uh, Q2, as I said in my prepared remarks, we're seeing good uh, um, price realization within ambulance, given the fact that they're eating into the tiers uh, quicker. Fire still has a significant, uh, you know, a longer backlog, so we continue to do that. But we are very myopic on you knowing each vehicle and what the price tier is that it is. So we do have a daily cadence where we look at price tiers and have full visibility to that. So we'd expect to see progression as we move through our backlog and are able to see that visibility. So we feel very encouraged and when we look at the outlook, it's reflective of that vehicle by vehicle buildup for F&E with ambulance being ahead of the curve with the throughput improvements we've seen. And then fire just beginning as we've talked about the throughput we saw in Q2 and then as we progress the remainder of the year, we'll start eating into more of those older units and getting into new price tiers as we move along. And, you know, if we if we were to look at what's uh, being booked 
today and the pricing tier that's coming in that, w- would that get you on a run rate basis whenever we do get to produce that to the uh, targeted uh, 8% margin for sure. range? For sure. Yes, for sure. Okay, super. And, and then uh, can we shift gears and talk about uh, RV, really strong uh, execution uh, from the team in, in that part of the business. G- can you talk about, uh, given uh, the shifts in backlogs for, for the industry, uh, how are you folks thinking about what uh, production rates uh, might look like a, a couple of quarters out? I, I know a lot of moving pieces out there, but w- would love to get your, your views. And uh, at the same time, um, from a margin standpoint, uh, how are you thinking about your through cycle uh, margin performance uh, if we do get to the point where we're cutting production? Yeah, so we still feel good uh, about uh, where we're at from an overall uh, recreation perspective being at a high single digits to 10% uh, EBITDA margin. So, Jerry, we look at our mix, and obviously we've talked about this over the last uh, year or so, or two years, about our mix of being heavily motorized, and we consider, continue to see strength in the B and C categories, if you look at our inventory across the whole portfolio, we're still down 25% our dealer inventory from where we were pre-COVID. So we have not normalized even from an inventory level. We're still still seeing a significant amount of retail sold units in that B and C category. So as our dealers, um, as you've heard from our competitors, are dealing with, um, you know, challenge financing in their floor plans that they have available given the fact that they have a lot of total units on their lots. You know, we're able to do a lot from a retail sold perspective where it's just a pass through that dealer. And our units continue to sell through, you know, uh, what we see quicker than the industry norm from the perspective. So we still believe we have the right products in place. We did, obviously, Class A never participated in the um, in the uptick that we saw. So we continue to see a mix shift there of more of uh, gas units versus high-end diesel. So we are seeing a mixed impact. But from a productivity perspective, we are looking at managing the production flow there, but we still feel comfortable with that 9 to 10% range exiting the year. Uh, super. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Mig Dobre with Baird. Please proceed with your questions. Yeah, good morning, Mark. Um, hi. Uh, I, I want to follow up on Jerry's question, this last question here. Um, you know, if, if, if I look at your implied guidance for recreation in, in, in the back half here, you're still, you're still looking north of $220 million of uh, quarterly revenue. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you are of the view that there is another sort of step down that we need to consider as we look into uh, fiscal 24, or if you're comfortable with the notion that, that this revenue run rate is uh, is sustained. I ask, obviously, because the backlog is looking different than it did even a quarter ago, and uh, uh, at least for me, it's a little bit harder to pinpoint exactly what the underlying level of demand uh, currently is. Yeah, we obviously don't want to get into 2024 guidance at this point, but you, we tried to include that in our prepared remarks. When you look at our B and C businesses, which are, you know, what we talked about, our higher margin businesses, we still have a six to nine month backlog in those businesses, so we still have a strong backlog in those units. So when we look at the back half of the year, we feel very comfortable in those categories. And then our, in our uh, Class A business, we still have uh, in excess of six months, and we have the production. It's more about a mix where we're seeing the consumer um, uh, go down into uh, more gas units versus the high-end diesels. And we talk about gas, you know, those margins are 50% of what a high-end diesel would, uh, would, would produce. And obviously the hours from a production perspective are less given the complexity of lower as well. So we are flexing our costs within that business, we, um, and so we feel – Good that we're going to be able to flex with the uh, with the units shift there, but of, of course we'll have uh, we'll have to maintain a different production cadence than we did at the beginning of the year. And then on the total okay. side, we're seeing what everyone else is seeing, but still we still have not normalized our inventory. And that Lance product, as you know, is more of a niche product within the whole total business. So we still have a, quite a heavy following there. And we did introduce, uh, you know, as we've announced, our Enduro off-road 
uh, product within the quarter, which was uh, well received as well. So we're seeing some uptick uh, from the acceptance of that product as well. Understood. Um, maybe uh, going back to um, fire and emergency, um, in maybe even more broadly on, under your guidance, you, you raised your uh, sales guidance by $100 million. Um, I'm assuming it's uh, primarily driven by fire and emergency, but I'd, I'd love some confirmation there. And, uh, you right. know, the – okay. Then, then the uh, second question here would be very high level of backlog, right, almost $2.9 billion. And, I, and I'm sort of curious as to how, how you think about, about this backlog. Uh, is, is this backlog – stickier, for instance, than what we have seen in, uh, in, in RV, uh, what's the risk of, of cancellations? Um, and when you're kind of talking to customers, um, um, how, how, are, how are they dealing with what appears to be very, very extended lead times at this point? Yeah, so uh, I would say from a lead time perspective, we are quoting lead times uh, at the same level or even within our, some of our competitors within the space, so we feel very good about the lead times, but it is important. I've had a lot of calls and discussions and meetings with our customers. The most important thing that we have on our uh, agenda right now is to increase throughput and get the units to our dealers as well as our customers, and we understand that, especially in the f and &E space and uh, from a public uh, providing these vehicles to the public. So, you know, from that side, they are stickier. So when you, we've talked about this before, you know, these are in the majority of the fire business. We haven't experienced uh, cancellations in the past because they are sticky when the uh, municipalities get the budget and they uh, go through the budgetary schedule and that, that money is earmarked. And as you can see in our balance sheet, we do get deposits on those units. So that money is uh, allocated to those units. So we feel good about that. And then ambulance, we continue to see strong, strong de demand there, um, and so we, and those are sticky as well. So we feel real good about that. We would not have a, a retraction like we did in recreation, which is more consumer-based model versus municipality-driven um, uh, segment as F and E. Uh, understood. Then my my final question. Um, can you can you frame maybe where you are in terms of capacity in F and E if if the supply chain finally normalizes to call it pre COVID levels um, how much more capacity do you have um, can you can you continue to grow or will you be contemplating uh, some sort of um, uh, capacity additions um, as, as as you look maybe beyond just your your guidance here into twenty four and beyond thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a really two-pronged, and we've talked about this before. We do have inherent inefficiencies that we've talked about over the last two years, and, you know, the productivity improvements and the cycle that we've been on gets us to where we feel comfortable, and it's really by a business unit by business unit perspective, so you'd have to go individually by those. We have some that are operating at 70% um, efficiency versus some that are in the high 90s, so it's really... But, you know, a lot of our factories run on a uh, single shift, not a second shift, so we have inherently built in there if we have labor co co uh, availability that we could actually double our capacity in our current footprint by just adding a second shift. We do supplement with uh, Fridays and overtime. Uh, a lot of our shifts are 410s, so we have the ability even to flex up on a full Friday shift if we needed to. So we're really working first to improve our production capacity and our cadence before we start thinking about expanding that. But we have that available in our current footprint to uh, more than double where we're at right now. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Jamie Cook with Credit Suisse. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning and congrats, Mark. Um, I guess just, you know, longer term strategic question, just, you know, as, as you're now officially the, you know, new, new CEO, any observations, um, you know, thoughts on your 2021 uh, annals day and the financial targets that you laid out, is that still the right way to think about things? Um, and also is this sort of the right portfolio, um, you know, that, that is in place for the company? And then follow up just, 
you know, the 175 million new share authorization, just thoughts on that sort of cadence and maybe perhaps what you see versus what you think the market's missing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, you know, overall from a, um, you know, from overall long term, or those are 2023 uh, goals that we set out and we still feel comfortable in what we provide in 2021 and the strategic imperatives that are driving those margins. We have reached those in, in, in recreation this year, so we feel good about the progress there. You know, F&E, we look at how we're going to exit uh, the year and what we're feeling about there, the momentum and the pricing that we put into the market. We believe, like I talked about earlier in the earlier question, that we'll get to those long-term goals. So we feel very good about that and the cadence around purchasing and um, the overall initiatives around uh, continuous improvement. You know, those are still tenants within the Red Drive business system. So as I talked about last earnings call, nothing has really changed from an overall long-term strategic imperative and what we're driving on a day-to-day basis to deliver on those. So I think those are well intact. Without the supply chain challenges that we had over the last 18 months, we probably would have been at those rates. So it's really a delay in achieving those. And when you look at the overall targets, we probably put in more price than what we anticipated in those initial targets. So it gives us some offer, um, you know, some optimism that uh, those are very achievable targets that we set out. And from a portfolio perspective, you know, like I've always said, even in my CFO role, we always assess what businesses and uh, will they deliver the uh, return that we expect. Right now, we are comfortable with what we have in our portfolio, but we're always open to looking at other things, uh, either tangentially or within, you know, tuck-ins. But uh, right now, our our capital allocation, as we talked about last. Uh, period is just to drive down debt, you know, pay down the interest, uh, the higher bearing interest uh, that we're experiencing now and, um, you know, work that way with opportunistic. Uh, when you talk about the share repurchase, that was going to expire here in September. So it was just making sure that we had the flexibility before our next board call and able to uh, do that. And, you know, obviously we believe that there's a lot of growth potential in our stock price. So we do want to be opportunistic to use that with the free cash flow generation that we're, we're doing here. So the extent we're exceeding or uh, seeing where we are from a cash flow, we will be opportunistic on uh, from a capital market perspective. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Our next questions come from the line of John Joyner with BMO Capital Markets. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, uh, good morning. Thank you. And uh, I'll say congratulations to Mark as well. Um, so uh, just maybe piggybacking on Jamie's uh, question on, on capital allocation, um, I know there's, you know, this uh, Class, a ch- Class A chassis that's out there. I mean, would that be at all toward the upper end of any priorities around inorganic additions, or is there any kind of read-through in terms of, like, how you view that business um, as it relates to, uh, you know, not adding that uh, asset? Yeah, no, not right now. I think we're comfortable with the with the uh, partners we have. So you know, you know, and we've always said that this isn't going to be an internal. We're trying to pick the right partners to be our suppliers. So that's uh, really a strategy we're continuing to do here uh, from a, a chassis perspective. We're not looking at you know building our own chassis. We get that a lot of questions we do in our in our fire business, but uh, that's one of the things we still have strong relationships with our OEM partners, and we feel comfortable in the space we're currently in. Oh, okay. Thank you. And then, and then in the, uh, you know, your release and prepared remarks, like, like most other industrial companies, you talk about supply chains getting better along with some, you know, kind of greater labor efficiencies, but have any supply-related issues lately cropped up uh, in the past few, few weeks? I mean, and I ask this question because We've heard uh, that some on-highway markets may have experienced uh, recent issues. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I say a few weeks, I'm talking about like, like yeah, two, yeah, we two do. three yeah, weeks we, in certain areas. Yeah, we, we do have those, so we are not immune to those uh, being, uh, you know, uh, in the category on the industrial side, so we deal with those on a day-to-day basis. I, I can say that the uh, our supply chain team has done very well. Remember, we are in a unique situation where we said that we have been under – Performing in a perform from a purchasing perspective, and we've done a lot of work from a dual sourcing perspective that would come to fruition here in the first calendar quarter of 23. And those are now we're we're well ahead where we thought we would be from a, a dual sourcing or alternative sourcing space. 
So we are seeing some momentum just from uh, in, improving our internal house here and expanding our supply base. But also, as I said in my quoted remarks, we are not um, we are not uh, waving the checker flag here. That we you know we know that there's things that pop up from a day to day, and we need to be nimble and be able to manage through those with our partners. So. Um, you know, that, that's what I would say there. So there's always these one-offs that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, got it. And then uh, maybe maybe one more if I, if, if I could. Um, when you think about these, you know, kind of alternative fuel technologies, such as hydrogen fuel cells, among others, um, when do you think these, I mean, maybe, <laughs> when do you think these will receive kind of critical mass? I mean, and, and, and what has the feedback been, the reliability, what is, how has that been in kind of the capability on, say, real-world usage versus um, a test environment on these products? Yeah, again, we're still we're starting to kick those off. So I would say real world. We obviously there's people in the space right now that have vehicles out there that are touting the um, capabilities of these units. You know, first uh, units at our ENC facility I quoted are just starting to be going down to production. But we have had obviously demo units that have been working. Uh, you know, several hundred thousands of miles. So we feel very comfortable in our solutions. And uh, we're in the like I said, my quoted remarks. Uh, it's really going to be customer choice on do they go to a full battery electric or fuel cell, um, and we're just giving we have the capability to provide both. So right now we're we're trying to be flexible so we meet our customer needs. But uh, I, I would say we still are seeing the early days of what the full um, take rate is going to be on a go forward basis. But we are seeing uh, heightened bidding activity like we talked about. So the ability to have funding to to pay for this. Uh, has also helped us. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question today, you may press star 1 from your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Mike Schleski with DA Davidson. Please proceed with your questions. Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. Um, a little granular, but I wanted to ask about capacity um, and some of the... Um, the products there uh, going electric. You know, in certain states like California, we're going to start to see. Uh, it sounds like you actually can't order a truck that's not electric in the in capacity segments. And so I'm curious if you could just tell us a little bit about whether um, you're prepared for a, a ramp up um, in your facility uh, to make more uh, EVs starting in 2024. Yeah, sure, for sure, Mike. And I was just out there last month. Drew and I both were out there last month. And, uh, you know, at Capacity, we do have a dedicated uh, facility there that is doing the development of both uh, the hydrogen fuel cell and electric. So we are conscious of that. We do have uh, the Hyper-Yell product that is starting to go into use case, maybe carrying on to John's earlier point. We do have uh, beta tests or what you would say use case development within some major Customer, so we feel very comfortable there in our ability to ramp there and the team, what they've done on the ice side, we're very confident that if it was to convert to all electric that we'd see the same sort of momentum there. So we have a very seasoned team and uh, so, uh, a team that's very capable with the throughput we've seen on the ice side that would carry over to the EV and hydrogen fuel cell side. So we feel very comfortable from that perspective. I'm curious, just to just follow up there, Mark, on it's a somewhat fragmented market. I'm curious whether you could tell us um, whether there's a, some players in the market are not going to have hydrogen or battery options going forward, and is there a reasonable uh, market share gain opportunity, call it 2024 or 2025, for that brand? For sure. Yeah, I think you'll see some substitutions at that point. Obviously, I think it will all carry on. With, we, we will probably participate to, to be able to pick up market share, but at the same time, when you look at our ability to um, produce those EVs, I think it'll be there, and it'll just be a matter of what the overall industry is from a take rate, uh, given the, the port activity and whatnot that these uh, in this uh, product serves, the industry they serve. Got it, got it. And just checking over to uh, F&E real quick. Um, it sounds like in at least in ambulance states, having higher content helped you in the quarter, content per vehicle. Um, but then it sounded like on the fire side, it, content was not a tailwind. Could you give us just a little bit of thoughts going, like the rest of this year and the first part of next fiscal year, whether content's going to be a tailwind for you or as, you know, as your, as your new COO 
uh, kind of gets uh, a better hold of the business, whether you'll be taking content out, trying to get more products out the door. Like what's the content outlook, I guess, and the and the and uh, how that might affect yeah, the next into, call it twelve months or yeah. so. Yeah, maybe not touching on twenty four right now, but when we look at the content, when we talk about content there, you know, on the fire side, we're talking about higher complex aerial units versus, uh, say, commercial chat, you know, commercial pumpers, and so the hour differential is significant there. So our ability to deliver. Uh, more units, and again, we're looking at a, a mix equation here. So when we're talking about fire, it's more around these commercial units versus a custom pumper or a chat or a aerial unit. So that's when we talk about low content for fire content. So if you look at Q2, we had more commercial type units going through, and then the ambulance side is really more of a reflection of the chassis mix we have now and our ability to produce more modular units, which we call them, versus vans, which are built like on a transit van unit. So we're able to have more high content modular units within ambulance. And we are able now with our chassis supply to mix in more uh, units based on a mix that is uh, more favorable to the production environment versus over the last year where we were just having to build on whatever chassis we received from the OEM. So we're now able to plan better, which has given us an improved mix profile, more of what we've historically seen and is benefiting now from the throughput initiatives that we've put in place. Very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, I'll pass it along. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we've reached the end of the question and answer session, and I'll turn the call back over to Mark Skanski for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Operator. And again, I'd like to thank uh, everyone again for joining us on today's call. I've been encouraged by the plant visits that I've conducted over the past four months and look forward to continuing to collaborate with the local teams as we build on the momentum created in the first half of the year. You know, there's been notable progress and engagement at a local level toward the rev drive initiatives that we detailed at our investor day two years ago. And one of key, you know, one of our rev's key values is to think like an owner. And I've been challenging our leadership team to enable all of our employees to do so at the local level. So again, I'd like to thank all of our employees for the hard work and results they achieved in the second quarter. And I look forward to speaking with all of you again with our third quarter results. Thank you. This will conclude today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.